John Noe unveils Greater Than We Believe with your host, Stephen King. Well, we're back. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stephen King. This is my friend, John Noe. We are bringing you a continuing series called Greater Than We Believe, speaking of Jesus. And we have had in the last 89 videos that we put on, we have uh, covered so many subjects. Uh, the subset subject we've been under and are still under now is called Kingdom Christianity. Uh, we're going to be wrapping this series up within the next few weeks. Um, last video what we had was a continuation of this is a six-part series called a worldwide call to greatness so 89 was part four this is our number 90 which is part five and this worldwide call to greatness is a a call out to you and me and everybody else that calls ourselves christians so john show us how it can be great <laughs> <laughs> well our seventh area okay reframing evangelism okay is it an old wineskin hmm hmm in bible times stephen animal skins were sewn up and used for personal wine containers mm -hmm. you're familiar with this so are most of our readers out there but with repeated use those wine skins would dry up mm -hmm. cease to expand and burst mm -hmm. <laughs> when still fermenting new wine was poured with them mm -hmm. So those old wine skids had to be discarded hmm. and replaced with new ones. And Jesus utilized wine skins as a metaphor for our new covenant life in the kingdom, mm -hmm. as opposed to the old covenant system and so forth, with the temple and the animal sacrifices yes. and all that kind of stuff. So he emphasized, for example, in Mark or Matthew 9, 17, neither do men pour new wine into old wine skins. If they do, the skins will burst. Mm -hmm. Well, hello. The wine will run out, and the wine skins will be ruined. And all the people back then in, those, in his day and times knew what he was talking about. Sure. There. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins, and both are preserved. And mm -hmm. that's both in Matthew and then in Mark 2, 22, and Luke 5, 37, and so forth. So I'm asking three pertinent questions here uh, regarding reframing evangelism. Number one. Is an old wineskin an apt metaphor today for Christian evangelism? Hmm. Its approaches, its efforts, and its results. And number two, how might the fully established, unending, ever-increasing kingdom, which we've been presenting throughout uh, this video, these video series, uh, better inform or amend our evangelism? Hmm. And three, if biblical Christianity is a kingdom-centered, kingdom-focused faith, why shouldn't our evangelism likewise hmm. be kingdom-centered and kingdom-focused? Yes. <laughs> Red flag. <laughs> All right. Many have recognized that there is something fundamentally wrong with the way we Christians do or largely do not do mm -hmm. evangelism. Yet most Christians consider evangelism, for example, more in his book, The Kingdom of Christ, most Christians consider evangelism and missions as the church's primary task. And Hunter considers it the primary means for changing the world. Hmm. So this is not a minor little issue, right? is it? So, how are we doing at evangelism? Hmm. And the answer is, drum roll please, <laughs> we stink at it! <laughs> Woo! Just tell me what Woo! you really think. <laughs> Woo! We stink at it! Yes, we do, we stink at it! Uh, we're not persuading hardly anybody. How much do we stink at it? Mm. 
5% of those people claiming to be Christians, mm -hmm. born again, saved, ever, ever share the gospel of salvation, Jesus Christ, with another person. Ever. That's our sales force. Wow. Isn't that something? Pastors often lament that they have major difficulty motivating their members and attendees to evangelize. Another discouraging, if not devastating, factor is according to scholar, secular humanist scholar, Jewish scholar Alan Wolf in his book, The Transformation of American uh, Religion. He said in 1994 survey, only 9% of Americans in general and 25% of self-described evangelicals could even say what the Great Commission is. Hmm. So how are we doing evangelism? Gee, stinky. <laughs> we stink at it. Right, N.T. Wright, begrudgingly concedes that the word evangelism still sends shivers mm -hmm. <laughs> down the spines of many people, <laughs> slash Christians. Yeah. Some people have been scared off by frightening or bullying tactics and, and tactless offensive behavior or embarrassing and na naive presentations of the gospel. Mm. Consequently, an attitude of indifference prevails throughout much of the church today regarding evangelism. D. James Kennedy in his book, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born, concedes, quote, most Christians give lip service to the command to spread the gospel, end quote. Now, Stephen, these difficulties and deficiencies were made quite real to me in a rather concerning fashion back in, back in the 90s. Okay. Shortly after I had climbed the Matterhorn, well, that was back in the 80s, because I climbed the Matterhorn in 1979. Uh... So this would be an ace. And so shortly after I climbed the Matterhorn and began my motivational speaker career as the motivated mountaineer mm -hmm. and became a Christian for sure back mm -hmm. in 1980. And my first book was published in 1984. This was the original version, Peak Performance Principles for High Achievers. Went mass market two years later, mm -hmm. uh, Berkeley. And then uh, 22 years later in 2006, the revised and expanded edition came out and so hmm. forth. And yes, this is a shameless uh, promotion. <laughs> <laughs> Enough of that. But shortly after that came out, the church that I was attending, a, a, a pretty large, major uh, uh, evangelical church here in, in, in the metropolitan area of Indianapolis, they asked if I would develop and run an evangelism training and equipping program for them because after all, they said, if you can write a book, <laughs> you can put this together. Hmm. Well, the irony at the time was I had never witnessed anybody in my life <laughs> and they wanted me to develop a program for doing it and train people. Something wow. I'd never even done before in my life. I'd never shared Christ with anybody. Hmm. But they insisted that I was the one to do it, and I was kind of intrigued by the challenge, so I jumped in hmm. and wholeheartedly. Sure. And learned how to do it, did it, you know, practiced it, and put together a five-session, uh, a five-session, 10-hour seminar. Here's our book. We happen to call it Soul Winning and other things. Here's our booklet back at the time. And yes, this is 1980s uh, mm -hmm. technology because we, we didn't have all the met media stuff. Mm -hmm. right? We used film strips, yeah, and, you know, things like that. But that was it. And so, so this was a five-session, 10-hour booklet or our seminar. And it culminated with the participants, including me, going out into adjacent neighborhoods around the church, house to house, in teams of two for three hours on a Saturday afternoon to share our faith. Hmm. Uh, and we used uh, the four spiritual laws of Campus Crusade <clears throat> as our primary method. And during those outings, we conducted a religious survey, and then we presented the gospel of salvation, and we invited residents to receive Christ if they hadn't done so before. I did nine of these, nine of these seminars, mm -hmm. you know, at different times, and the results were exciting. We averaged sending out ten to fifteen teams of two, you know, that had gone through this because you had to go through the seminar, yeah, you know, to do that. 
uh, and, it, and it followed the seminar. And when the teams returned to the church and reported their results, I mean, th- there was an excitement like, man, I can't, I've never had anything, I've never experienced mm. anything like this. I mean, I mean, you know, really excited, and we celebrated and all that stuff. And these times were joyous for all concerned. And usually we had tallied up 30 to 50 people is what we averaged per time going out in the neighborhoods were those kind of teams who prayed with us to receive Christ as their Savior. Wow. Again, nine times we did this and went out evangelizing into the neighborhoods. And then it happened. Abruptly. Uh Uh-oh. The elders canceled the program. Even though over 90% of the church attendees had yet to participate. Hmm. They cited complaints, but the complaints weren't from the neighborhoods. They were from influential church members in that church who opposed us doing these kind of activities. Said it just wasn't right for us to be going out and imposing our faith on people. And it was over. Wow. It was done. Stephen, that was my first major experience is becoming a Christian for sure in 19, 1980. Uh, my first indication that something might be severely wrong with the way we Christians preach, teach, perceive, and practice our faith. Hmm. Well, let's address seven systematic or systemic uh, problems. And as we shall see you know, with evangelism, as we shall see, our problems and our difficulties with evangelism are more systemic than most Christians have been willing to admit. So, you ready to go? Yes. Here we go. Systemic problem number one, its prime focus is almost entirely otherworldly. Hmm. Saving people from this world. And the typical soul-winning pitch, especially back then, is, was then, primarily, and probably still is, if not exclusively, this. If you were to die tonight... <laughs> where would you go? Where would you go? Yes. Or do you know for certain that, 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 that you're going to go and be w- with God in heaven? Mm-hmm. Or, the eschatological one, if Jesus was to return tonight, <laughs> would you be ready to meet him? Hmm. Well, these pitches dominated you know, the evangelical methods and, and, and models back then. And one pastor tersely informed me back then. He said, God is not interested in this world. God has only one agenda, and that is getting us ready for heaven. Now, that was back in the 80s. Wow. But guess what? Here is Billy Graham's column. <laughs> uh, June 6, 2020. And guess what he's talking about? Christians are of another world. See that? Am I making that up? <laughs> sure is. Christians are another world. It says, uh, answer, Christians must live in the, wor- in the world. We are to influence the world for the purpose of winning the world to Jesus Christ. He said, we must show the world that we are citizens of another world. Mm-hmm. There it is. Yep. Still here and rearing its ugly head. Yep. Isn't it? All right. As a result of this otherworldly focus and limitation, it has hamstrung our evangelism, as we as we shall see. Right. Where are you, NT? There you go. NT Wright notes this somatic or systemic uh, aspect well. He says that there is almost nothing about going to heaven when you die in the whole New Testament. <laughs> you realize that? There is absolutely nothing about going to heaven when you die in the whole New Testament. That according to Wright, you don't check him out, see if he's right. Thus, this limitation reduces the gospel to only being relevant for personal redemption. And that's half of the gospel. Uh And grossly insufficient and ineffective. And claiming that God has only one agenda, getting us ready for heaven, for example, will not enable us to pass along the kingdom in our country Hmm. to our children and grandchildren and future generations in greater shape than we found it, will it? Hmm. No, it won't. Thus, this realization brings us to our next systematic problem, and that is this. It's hell avoidance. (laughs) And fire assurance. Have you heard of that? Oh, yeah. Uh, driven, centered, and focused. Sarcastically, it's termed 
Uh, and this is by uh, Rush Dooney in his book. Uh, oh, where have I? Uh, in his service. Oh, there it is. Right there. In his service, he calls it the gospel of avoiding hell. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Uh, but there are significant difficulties with the word hell. You realize that? Would you, uh, would you like to see a picture of, of hell today? Yes, I'd love that. What hell looks like today? Yeah. Would you? Yeah. Have it right here? Took a picture, huh? In my formerly <laughs> nicotine. No, no. no. <laughs> uh, two pictures. Okay. Two pictures. Here's one. Oh, hell's pretty. Isn't that nice? Yeah. It's got pretty trees pretty? and everything and nice skyline. Can you show that to people? Put, insert that? Yes. So? Huh? Here's another one. Wow. That's a little higher up picture there, but that's a nice big valley. Uh-huh. Well, it's Gehenna. Mm -hmm. you can, it's over in Israel. Yes. It's a real literal place. Yes. And it was in Jesus' day yes. time. It, it was uh, formerly known as the Valley of Hinnom. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, right. And uh, you can take tours of it. Yes. So you can go to hell over there and, and, and not have to leave this world. Well, here's the point. There are no equivalent Hebrew or Greek words for the translation of hell in the Bible of, the, of original words. Hence, Rush Dooney, here I go, was spot on when he declares it is an error to teach that Christ saves us from hell. Hmm. Because there's no hell in the Bible. Yes. Wow. Secondly, uh, most unbelievers do not believe they are going to hell. Hmm. As I talked about in my book, Hell Yes, Hell No. Yes. Excellent book, by the way. Do you know how many unbelievers believe there is a hell? I mean, one half of 1%. Wow. That's not very many. Not very many, is it? One half of one's therefore starting evangelism presentations with the proposition that it's a, <laughs> that you're going to hell hmm. is a strategic error, wouldn't you think? Yes. And a lesson in frustration to unbelievers, we are preaching nonsense. Right. And all and, and most have no as most no have no belief in hell. Uh, uh, Jim Henderson and Mark Casper and Jim and Casper go to church. Uh, appropriately recognize eternal damnation will not work on someone who does not believe hell is real. This is true. Duh. 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 Yeah. All right. Uh, Greg, in his book, uh, All You Wanted to Know About Hell, he, he, I, hmm. he, he could have written that and wouldn't even have put anything in it. You know? But uh, he says this, if we wish to characterize the reticence of modern preachers to a place to place an emphasis on hell in their evangelism, we must first account for the same reticence found in the preaching of the apostles and evangelists of the early church. Never do we find hell mentioned in any of, this, of the evangelical sermons of the preachers that are recorded in the Bible, hmm. which has become standard evangelical fare in American evangelism. Do you see a problem with this? Hmm. Somewhat. All right. Furthermore, Jesus never threatened people with hell, with the prospect of going to hell. He talked about going to Gehenna. Yes. Right or there. being thrown into Gehenna, but that yeah. was a real literal place. Mm -hmm. The garbage dump and so forth. Yeah, it didn't look like that back and then. And I've written extensively on this yeah. and hell yes, hell no. So yes. we're not going to repeat that here or get into yes. that here. So, but, I, but I do recommend it to your attention on that. Uh, so Gehenna was a real, literal, familiar place to them mm -hmm. back then, not another worldly place or an afterlife place. And it had a long, sad, and sordid history that was well-known history, uh, uh, you know, during in Jerusalem, you know, back in day, those day and times. So today, it's a nice, pleasant valley yes. over there. And you can take tours through it and through the Holy Land and, and so forth. Regrettably, Gehenna is one of four original scriptural words that are blatantly mistranslated as hell. The other the other three are Sheol, mm -hmm. Hades, and Tadaris. Yes. None of those should be translated as hell. And in proper uh, Bibles, they aren't. Okay, third. Third problem. It's cross-centered and sin-focused. Well, why would that be a problem? Hmm. Hmm. 
Well, our evangel, or as some, as many say, our evangelism must be centered on the cross. Preachers all over the world insist. But guess what? Jesus' evangelism wasn't. Mm. It wasn't. Jesus didn't center his evangelism on the cross. Or they say, it's all about Jesus, to share Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit and leave the results to God. But for Jesus, it was never all about Jesus. Hmm. In fact, he kept mostly under wraps anything about him and only shared that with a few <clears throat> of his closest followers toward the end of his earthly ministry. Yes. For Jesus, it was all, his evangelism was all about the kingdom, the kingdom. of God. Yeah. Hello. Big difference. <laughs> Red flag. In reality, therefore, we are sharing bad news. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of good news. People are sinners and are, and are not going to heaven. That's bad news. Yeah. We're sharing bad news. Unfortunately, that approach doesn't draw people. No. It, it, it repels them. And, 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 you know, so anyway, the criticism, Greg, Greg's criticism here is this. He says, folks need to hear the bad news before they'll be ready to hear the good news. Right. Well, guess what? Hmm. They hear the bad news, they have no interest in the good news. Right. Just doesn't work. My response. Uh, if you preach and evangelize with the gospel only focused on forgiveness of sins and going to heaven after you die and avoiding hell, you will be mired down in the muddle of mediocrity and indifference that many Christians find themselves in today. And the problem is we have not become, as Willard maintains in his book, Living in Christ's Presence, we have not become bearers of the kingdom. Mm. That's what we need to become. And furthermore, as he correctly maintains, we cannot have a gospel that deals only with sin. Mm. We cannot. Notably, and I'd like you to read this, if you would, <clears throat> on page uh, 54, if I got mocked there, mm -hmm. if you would, what, what he uh, adds to this. He says, Jesus' gospel is not this. How do you know you're going to get into heaven when you die? <laughs> That's not the gospel. No. His gospel is, now the kingdom of God is available. There you go. This uh, gospel of Jesus, of course, includes the free promise of the forgiveness of sins by grace alone. Yeah, it includes yes, that. It includes that. Yeah, yeah. Well, salvation is indeed good news. Yes. But it's only a piece of the bigger good news, which is the kingdom of God. Yes. And you can't get into the kingdom unless you're saved. Right. <clears throat> okay. Sorry to say, and by and large, Christians today have an inadequate worldview. That's because we've been al uh, allowed, or we have allowed those in leadership to water down the radicalness of Jesus for his day and time and our day and time. And we wonder why people's experiences of uh, uh, many in the church seem to be flat. Hmm. Well, hello. The problem is we have a major disconnect. We have not taken Jesus at his word. Therefore, Stephen, everything must change. Where is, uh, uh, my guy, where is my guy, where is my guy? Oh, here he is, right here. If you would, mm -hmm. uh, McLaren, if you would read page 243. Page 243. It says, as long as evangelism presents a gospel concentered on the need for personal salvation, individuals will acquire a faith that focuses on maximum benefits with minimal obligations. Read that again, please. As long as evangelism presents a gospel centered on the need for personal salvation, individuals will acquire a faith that focuses on maximum benefits with, with minimal, minimal obligations. And then he finishes out by saying, sanctifying grace of God in Jesus Christ uh, is not just for the sinner, but also for a society beset by structural sin. Wow. Hmm. Wow. Rush Dooney adds in his book, Law and Society, he said, much of evangelism today is incapable of creating a culture. It either surrenders to the world or flees from it or both. Such people can build large neo-evangelical churches, but they cannot establish a Christian culture. Right. Not at all. 
Am I building that too high? No, nope, we're good. Four, it's encumbered with guilt, judgmentalism, and condemnation. Hmm. Really? Yes, our evangelism approaches send an Ann Hobnum message. I'm saved and you You're ain't. <laughs> Is, is that judgmentalism? Just a is little that bit. Guilt trip. Is yeah. that condemnation? It widens the credibility gap. Yes, it does. Uh, it's us versus them. It's yeah. confrontational, and such an approach was totally foreign to Jesus. Right. Totally, and to the early church, it raises people's shackles as we come across as arrogant. Yes. You think we can become across as arrogant? Me? <laughs> <laughs> Rude and bigoted and hypocritical and judgmental and self-serving, it creates a huge image problem. As cock and man disclaim in the lost message of Jesus, when we try to get people to follow Jesus by reminding them of their shortcomings and failings, yep. I'm saved and you ain't. Yeah. And, and others, rubbing in the guilt and then calling them to confess and give it all up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they laugh. Yeah. The truth is, Jesus never used that tactic. Mm. We gotta draw that. Jesus never used that tactic. Right. Okay. The world is full of people who have been told time and again by the church what not to do. Mm. What they long to hear is about what God wants them to do. Right. Isn't that good? Yes. Pointing out that they are sinners, uh, it just doesn't work. It's about calling to something rather than away yes. from something. Jesus constantly looked for the good in people. And Stephen, most certainly we need to restructure our evangelism message and approach into what we're talking about mm -hmm. here, about calling people to, uh, to something, not from, just away from right. Well, what do we call them to? The mm, kingdom. Exactly. Yes, yes. Number five. It goes against societal changes. Mm -hmm. Lord knows we have seen so substantial changes in society in our lifetime, have we not? Especially in the last several decades. And that, and our, re, our evangelistic efforts and approaches of the past no longer work. So in an article in uh, Christianity Day magazine in 2013 called Blase Believers, Colin Hansen reports that some Christian leaders contend that we are divided and ineffective in our witness because the Western world has turned against us and the church has abandoned the truth of the gospel. Well, yeah, it amen. Yes. We made the gospel all about salvation hmm. when it's about the kingdom Yes. and salvation. No question Hansen is right uh, about the truth of the gospel. And we have presented plenty of a, a collaborating evidence in what we've been talking about in this, uh, uh, th this video series, have we not? Mm -hmm. Six, it's all about me. Yes. Undeniably, our traditional witnessing approach is a selfish strategy and agenda that does not match up with the New Testament witness. Jacobs. Cindy Jacobs, in her book, The Reformation Manifesto, affirms this fact in answer to the question of how did this thinking affect my actions? She responds, first of all, I thought I was only responsible to God for living a godly life rather than being a steward of my nation, its laws, and society in danger, mm -hmm. in general, versus teaching that our responsibility extends to seeing the kingdom of God manifested in our nation. It's not all about me. Yes. It's all about the kingdom. Yes. And seventh and lastly, Christians are gripped with fears about evangelism. Hmm. You think that's right? Yeah, absolutely. Not so, see if you agree or disagree with this. Not surprisingly, most Christians dread talking to a family member hmm. about Jesus. You think that's right? Or friends. Yep. Or neighbors or co-workers, or even strangers about their faith. Yep. Why? Why? They're afraid they'll be let down. For fear of alienation and right. losing them. Yes. They are most uncomfortable pushing, quote, my faith off on others, or hitting them over the head. With the Bible. Yeah. With the Bible. It's not being sensitive. Yeah, and it's, not, and it's definitely not woke. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it's boorish and bothersome to them. Uh, okay. 
Therefore, few people witness because of that. And yet we have the word of life. Hmm. Then why are we keeping it to ourselves? Yes. In my opinion, the bottom line is two reasons. Number one, we're not really sold on our faith. <laughs> oh, it's okay for us and we're not going to give it up. But it's not good enough to go out and tell everybody about mm -hmm. it. Listen, if we were really sold on it, you couldn't keep us quiet. Yes, yeah, true. That was true, and that was true in the that's first. That's true. Time. It's no longer true today. Mm -hmm. We go to church. That's it. Yep. And two, the fear of man is greater than the fear of God. That's so sad, but it's so true. Daniel Colenga readily admits, and I'm going to end with this in his. Uh, article 2014 Charisma Magazine called Simplicity of Sharing the Gospel. He says, we know we should, but we don't. <laughs> <laughs> in a nutshell, that's the state of evangelism in among America, uh, Christians in America today. It seems we have subconsciously allowed fear to masquerade as a legitimate reason for silence. Mm -hmm. He, he next cites four principles and five tips for overcoming these fears and communicating the gospel. However, these principles and tips are merely placing, in my opinion, a Band-Aid over these seven systematic issues that we, did, we recently covered, so I'm not, I wasn't even going to bother to mention them here. Sure. Because it's just Band-Aid stuff. And Band-Aids fall off. <laughs> Don't stick. Again, there is a crying need, Stephen. Uh, for a different message and a different approach for doing evangelism. Mm -hmm. And that centers on the kingdom of God, the central teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that will be the topic of our next video. Wow. Thank you. Well, folks, what did you think? <clears throat> Um, this was this was really good, and one of the things that really hit home with me, I had to write it down so I'd make a note. He's talking about calling people to something and not telling them to go away from something. There is a real difference, and it reminded me of an expression I've heard for years called, nature hates a vacuum. So if a person's head is full of all the wrong stuff, and we want to give them truth to replace that, if you pull out the wrong stuff, there's a vacuum there. If you don't give them something to put right in to take its place, nature hates a vacuum, and they're going to suck in some more wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and we've mentioned before how unlearning things is pretty difficult. It's hard. And so people right now, if they have got the wrong impression about a lot of things that we can help them with, with that the kingdom will, will bring them answers to, we have to bring it to them in a positive manner. And so having to change the way we approach people is a necessary evil. And I say evil only from the standpoint we hate change. <laughs> but we've been doing it this way for so long and it hasn't worked. Let's listen. Let's give it a shot next week. What's that quote about what, what is ignorance? Is doing yeah, something? do the same thing over and over and it expecting different results. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so so let's, let's look next week. Listen to what he's got to say and see if he's got a better idea. I, I'm, I'm along. I'm with you on this. I do. I yeah, do. I, I'm do. happy to hear that. <laughs> so uh, be blessed. Uh, continue to tune in. Please pray for our ministry and bring in your friends. And, and, and let's get together and let's start really promoting the kingdom that Jesus was promoting and uh, salvation. Salvation just comes right on its heels. So we love you folks. We'll see you next week. Thank you. Good night. Okay.